Recording is on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Papers We Love Seattle. Uh, I'm glad all of y'all are here. I, I'm very excited for tonight. We have a really great uh, speaker, Scott Francis, who's going to be talking all about uh, knitting and uh, and 3D knitting in particular, and uh, and a, a, a generalized provable. Uh, a, a compiler for for knitting uh, machines which is super rad um uh actually read the paper uh yesterday and was like really pumped by it so um uh so uh first off thank you all for being here and uh a couple a couple things uh we are a chapter of uh, the global papers we love community come check us out uh on slack uh, if you go to um, uh, papers we love uh, slack .com, you can uh, sign up to our slack room and we're in the uh, the hashtag uh, Seattle channel so come join us there um, uh, the, we do have a code of conduct uh, it basically says don't be a jerk uh, if if uh, you and you can read that on uh, the meetup.com invite for this or on uh, the papers we love uh, github uh, and it has uh, contact information for both max and myself if you ever feel uncomfortable or, or attacked you know feel free to reach out to max feel free to reach out to me uh either uh now later uh and we will address those issues so uh, we take that seriously and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, does anyone have any announcements, things coming up? I know the Strange Loop CFP, I think, is still open. I'm pretty sure. Strange Loop, if you don't know, is a great conference uh, in St. Louis. They are live uh, are in person this year, which is very exciting, uh, in, in St. Louis in September. So... You know, if you're if you like papers you love, you'll like Strange Loop. This is basically an entire conference that is uh, papers we love. So um, uh, definitely check that out. I think it's the Strange Loop dot, uh, dot com. Pretty sure. Any other people have uh, announcements, local or global? Did I miss anything? Um, I will. If any of you don't want to type, if any of you don't want to talk, then but have a question. Um, I will make sure that um, anything that's in the chat will get asked, that Scott will hear any question that's typed in the chat. So um, feel free to just uh, feel free to just type there if you have any questions. Heck yeah. All right. Well, very cool. Um, with, with that, I will pass it off to my friend Scott. To, oh, uh, I one oh. more thing. Uh, if you go to the Slack, we have our um, we have a Google Sheets of all of our future talks. Um, if you don't see a talk in a month, it means we don't have a talk planned that month, yes. and you could talk that month. Uh, all you have to do is let us know, and we'll put you in that list. Just yeah, I will I will uh, put that list in the chat right now, uh, so people can see it. Yes. Uh, I yep. also put the link to the uh, to the Slack in chat, so we can uh, we can all riff off that as well. All right. Mm -hmm. And a point we always also like to make is that we'll accept any paper. It doesn't have you know we've done a lot of CS papers because there's a lot of CS nerds, but as this I'd like to do these papers to show we do more than that. I know Trevor himself has given it a whole business management paper thing, so we will accept any paper as mm -hmm. long as it's somewhat serious. Uh, I would say as long as it's approachable to CS majors, we have people who also fair know point. Yeah. But we have done non-serious papers. True. Honestly, as as long as it's paper you love, you know, if it's something you're interested in, you don't even need to be an expert. Like they're, 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 no one needs to be an expert on, on it. As long as it's something that you found interesting and you want to learn a little bit more about, it, come and uh, lead a discussion. This is a discussion. It's not, it's not a a a one-way uh, thing. It's more of us like talking and learning together. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got a presentation. I try to keep to things, but yes, we'll go for questions and kind of stop and whatever. And like I said, because there's no, I don't exactly have a huge amount of slides to cover everything. Because there's, it was either transcribe the paper or don't. We'll also be doing a bit of be trying to get all the screen sharing right because we'll be sharing the presentation to the paper itself and the sample video too because there was one included on the site. So, which actually shows it because one of the things I, anyway, I guess we have kind of started. So let's do the whole. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Take it away, Scott. All right, where's the buttons? Uh, Jitsi is almost like Zoom, but not entirely, et cetera. Um, all right, can everyone see that? Oh, wait. Oh, good. Okay, Jitsi does do that. Correct. Oh, it doesn't even show my pointer. Right. Um. Anyway, yes, as the thing has said, this is um, the 3D compiler for machine editing. Did this expand everyone, or I guess it's just the tile, and I'm talking now. Yeah. It's the first I've done Zoom sharing before. It's the first time I've really done extensive Jitsi work, but I guess you can do it. These slides, by the way, will be posted. We also have an official GitHub, and we will also be posting these uh, later on when we're all done with this. So yes, all the things. So yes, don't worry about having to stop to write things down. I will ensure that everything I cover and everything is in here will be in that uh, thing I submit to it, which the address is also on our channel. Anyway, hello. This is a 3D compiler for machine knitting by um, Disney Research. It may kind of I know some people will know, but Disney, surprisingly enough for all their faults, actually has extensive researching in various areas that are not computer science and things. And they are also quite happy to publish stuff. Usually if they've made, either they've already made their money on it or they're about to do it with something that's patentable. So their papers are free to read. There'll be links to this. There is a link to this one. LA has a bunch of ones. They do everything, including knitting, uh, costume design. There's robotics. Apparently there's like a, apparently there's a live action Spider-Man robot that does flips and twirls and crushes the walls, and I'm not kidding about that. Anyway, but we're here about this paper, a 3D compiler for machine knitting. And this paper is actually from about 2016, I think, or 20, something like that. So it's actually a few years older than that, and it has some consequences we'll be getting to. But the paper itself basically it goes over, you know, we have had, we've had knitting machines since the 1800s. You know, we now have automatic, really fancy knitting machines, but you still have to program them manually. And we'll actually go through the slides at the paper. And so this kind of says, hey, here's a whole bunch of things. And the the title says, oh, this is a compiler. It's really a lot more than this paper is a lot more than that. You know, there's really three separate things going on in this paper. The one, we have the basic operations of, I should have said, electric electronic knitting machine. So there's actually the whole operations which you can do are broken down versus they'll mention the paper writing G code or things by hand. That's an old uh, uh, for 3D, sorry, for computer assisted design, that's the actual how you control a tool. Like, oh, here's a tool X, raise head, move over three three inches, lower tool kind of thing. And they've said that's that's usually how you program these machines. Move this needle back, up this needle, switch this needle around kind of deal. And so they kind of generalized all of that out into the basic operations of any automatic thing. And again, we've had knitting machines since the 1800s or, or even longer. So there's, you know, not exactly a whole lot to... Uh, worry about that. So um, they also cover their transfer planning algorithm as part of the compiler. That, as I said, they'll probably need some help talking about. That goes into some interesting things there, but that's kind of the key to it um, because the other part is the actual compiler itself that uses that algorithm to do it. The, alg so the algorithm translates um, the designs you feed into it and the basic knitting operations links them around uses the algorithm to then actually schedule how the needles are moved around and then translates that to machine specific commands for moving the needles. So like I said, I focused on some things and I've gone a bit of history because I also don't know how many people have actually done knitting or stitching. I've done a little bit, not much. I have a lot of friends who do cosplay and who are very knowledgeable about it. And so I've, they'll probably yell at me for not covering everything, but we'll try to at least do a simple quick history, which can get really complicated, but yes. Um, knitting itself, there's always been shorthand for describing knitting in, in terms of instructions, as we said, like 1800s. Um, you can Google up the stocking frame or the 1800s England uh, Industrial Revolution. We I could have easily done this whole talk on that kind of history, but we probably don't have time for that. So, but the thing to keep in mind though, is that on one respect, this is nothing new for actually how to uh, create and how to instruct machines to uh, stitch these things automatically. And before anyone pops up, um, obviously we could say, oh, this is it. Computers came about it because of jackward cards. Do remember that jackward cards in the jackward machine was actually used for 
uh, looms and weaving, which is not the same thing as knitting or knitting machines. And any knitter will probably smack your knuckles for suggesting they're similar, but they're good concepts. Um, continuing, let's see. Oh, yeah. So one of the things I actually found helpful, which links we posted to it, is a site called Stitch Maps. And so one of the things is that there's always been, how do you do stitching? And kind of lists and uh, guides and things. But there's even things like you'll you have your needles in your hand. You'll actually have what looks like a little stop counter that actually says when you're going up rows. Because everything, you loop over yarn and loop it over things to make knots. Or sorry, to make knots, pearls, stitches, and lines. And I'm also more lingo I've forgotten. So, but normally you get that. This is, for example, a feather and fan pattern. So normally the map for that would look like this. And this is a traditional thing called a grid chart. Um, and if people are, if you're complaining about it, yeah, please feel free to ring me later on. Um, each one of these, as you can see, is like each uh, cell in there represents as you're going, because you are basically going left to right to assemble each one of these things. And so each one of those the cells has an operation in there. They have their own little shorthands. You can see like the little dash, <clears throat> like a Y, upside down Y or the O, and these all represent very specific stitches and techniques as they're going through. Normally, uh, the stitch maps, as they put it, is actually nice because what they do is that normally yarn isn't going to look like that. Normally, if it's in your hand or doing whatever, it's going to be all over the place and curls and uh, loops so they actually had a neat technique where you can actually they can split it out and I'd do some transforms to show it just like this which is apparently a lot more easier for knitters to read and work with it also provides for kind of some more easier to insert techniques so the you know this ktog joins together these two knit stitches as they kind of said um, again terminology i'm i kind of somewhat know but not really but you can see kind of like the whole you can probably see my can you see my pointer there's my pointer Maybe you can't. Um, you can kind of see their whole, like this yeah, Y is going to join these two kind of stitches up and going through that kind of way. And so then we can also say, um, they actually show like you can also use this kind of technique to insert rows or kinds of things like that. Yeah. This disc reach, ugh, this disc decrease marks the end of the stitch column that began with this increase. So that's a quick way to expand out the column, I guess. So, And of course, there's also a stitch marker placed here. We'll get stuck in a decrease, but one place here won't. Um, I think the whole point of this section is there's a lot of history, there's a lot of terminology, and there's a lot of, you know, as CS majors and things, we think, oh, we've done a lot of things, and everything can be disrupted. No, I, this has been going again since the 1800s. There's lots of techniques, there's lots of knowledge, and lots of things. So when it comes to it, things get complicated in a hurry, which is, again, everyone that knows this, and that's what the paper is talking about. So as we go on, though, one of the things they immediately um, they immediately start dropping lots of references to it. And one of the things they actually start out by saying like, oh, well, they had to specialize a compiler for V-bed machines since they didn't have access to an X-bed. Well, what is that? And this is where we actually get into the machine knitting kind of stuff. Um, the knitting basics here. Oh, yeah, so V-bed, um, basically. So there are two beds, um, as they put it, located across from each other, the front bed and the back bed. And these are beds of needles, by the way. So basically there's uh, two needles. Yeah, and this feature allows, a, this is the core of a machine knitting where you can hold not only sheets, but also tubes. Keep in mind when you knit, like the basic primitives of knitting are pretty much um, sheets and tubes and you have to form everything else out of them. Even a shirt, like will usually get uh, sewed together in two flat patterns to the front. So then the sleeves will be two separate tubes that'll get sewed on to again and I apologize again for any professional knitters out there. They mentioned that, oh, the X bed is up to 11. It has extra elements, which are called holding hooks. And so each, um, so basically every needle on the front and back on the V bed um, gets an extra kind of little holding loop, almost like a little um, register. If you can think of the needles as a register by themselves, each an X bed gives you like another register for each register that the needle already has. Um, the operator, actually, let's see can I, if I can shift to. Um, let's see if I can do this correctly. And again, with the recording, let's see if I can reshare too. Um, sharing, sharing, sharing. Uh, yeah, as I switch over to, as I said, I'm a little bit. All right, there we go. We'll watch a quick few minutes, seconds of this video to see what actually we're talking about. You can see there's lots of complexity going on in here. And here we go. 
and this is a V bed. So that's two needles right there. No, sorry, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, the screen share could be interesting as we flip between all the things, but yeah. Um, yes, Trevor's mentioned it is super cool to watch. And that is the other fun thing. I mean, I could literally just also just do a whole lot of um, videos of knitting machines and things like that. There's plenty out there. Um, and yes, imagine whole rooms of them kind of humming and going back and forth. It's pretty big, it's pretty amazing, and there's a lot of things. Um, but yeah, they started to talk about operations. So you've seen how the needles work. There's lots of complicated things that are all going and you know touching each shelf. So what they did is they generalized the operations for it needles down to four basic operations. So we got tuck, where you basically just add a loop that's on your needle, using the other needle to help you with it, something like that. Knit, pull the loop through all the current needle loops. And one of the things here with knitting that I kind of half remember but had to rediscover is that basically you can hold multiple loops on a single needle. And so the really advanced knitters can have up to, what, five, six, or probably a bunch more. And so again, that goes back to when we think of like a needle could also be thought of as a as a stat as a simple stack register, basically. So you can push loops onto there. And so basically tuck will add a loop to that needle. And then when we say knit, then whatever loops are in that needle will all get finished off. We can say transfer, where we say, all right, every needle gets moved on to an, every loop, every loop on the needle gets moved over to another needle. You can't do one or two, you have to do everything at once. So and finally, split, where you basically do a knit followed by a transfer. So basically, you pull a loop, throw your needle loops, and then move all the loops you just connected over to the other needle. So those four operations pretty much are how all the knitting machines work, or all the modern V and X bed knitting machines work. Um, they mentioned there's also three or four utility operations they kind of specialized in as well. So that's drop, which is basically just as a knit with the no yarn and that's kind of like either a no op to like to move the needles around basically um there's an in which oh yeah as my slides are a bit off sorry they, yeah in is a, in is add active yarn and out is remove the active yarn so again then they said these are more yarn magic this doesn't actually do anything to the garment this just kind of is helpful in the compiler to then specialize out these things can you see where we're kind of going with this why this is kind of a neat thing you basically have in a whole abstract machine, basically. So you have these four operations along with a few extra ones. And as CS people, we know once you've got all those, you're almost, no, I won't say we're quite Turing complete, but you know, you've got a stack, you've got tape and you can uh, control the tape. So hey, anyway, um, and as we go on to, then we get to the compiler. Let's see, did I do? Yeah, okay. So the compiler, as they said, so we have those four operations. So you're basically going to translate to those almost like that um the, the operations could also be seen as like an intermediate language like an lvm because yeah, eventually those operations will then get translated to the actual mechanical instructions to, to move the needles um but so yeah the compiler itself you know we'll read those and so the each we'll read the primitives you feed into it like the sphere the um, the uh, bleh, sorry tubes sheets and other patterns as we'll see in a minute take those down um, for each one of those, each primitive you get, you're going to break into horizontal slices. Because remember, we go left to right with stitching. And so it's going to be, or with knitting, you're going to break. So you have to break every single one of those primitives into the horizontal slices. And then each slice, as they said, has, you know, there's a knitting time. And this is abstract. This isn't like an actual how many seconds. I get the impression it's kind of like either a vector clock or some kind of like simple counter to say there's an abstract time this kind of operation is going to take. Each slice, when they do it, also says how many loops are going to be on the needle at this point. And more, most importantly, there's also a parameter for the needle itself. This is how they actually do linking, which ironically is a actual physical and physical and metaphys or meta bleh, a physical and abstract thing in this as well. Because not only are you linking the things together with the code, you're also linking it together in real life. By the way, you actually do hire people to do that. A lot of the older machines, where you would basically knit out. Um, the tubes or the sheets and then you would actually have someone i think it's either called a fitter or whatever or possibly something again apologies to knitters someone would actually have to hand stitch those together by hand and so that's where you would still get the whole sweatshop mentality of like okay you've got all these cloth that's been kind of knitted out like that machine knitted but now you gotta actually hire people to actually sew it all together to make the final product so with their stuff as they point out they can kind of do it all in one at this point 
um, after the compiler step, we actually come to an actual linking step where we link the adjacent slices. And that's where the parameter is useful because it's used in some of the uh, optimization techniques, if I remember right. Um, uh, what was the whole thing there? Yeah. Sorry, as I flick the paper in the background, which, oh, that's right. Here's linking steps, a boundary resolution. Yes, so there's like a bunch of complicated kind of things they're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's a bunch of complicated things they're doing because it is still a physical product. It isn't like this is all abstract um, language or abstract bits in a computer. There's actual physical yarn and needling or physical yarn out there that you don't want to let slip off or have it go somewhere else you don't want it to. So there's a whole lot of stuff in there. Again, unfortunately, I didn't I didn't capture just all the notes, but I'm reading off the paper here. Um, uh, where'd you go? Right, so they have boundary resolution going it, and that's again where they do the whole um, bunny and gluing styles, which also correspond to kind of the whole how do you stabilize a loop, basically. Um, yeah, when it goes on from that, um, of course, they also note that it's not covered in their, oh, never mind, I guess they did kind of cover that. They call it a stash thing. That's really that whole loop management kind of thing with the stash operation in that part. Um, Anyway, so this is all really amazing. Yes, we've got the needles. We can move back and forth. We can make the arm. We can make the whole thing. Yeah, we can make the things. We can also link each. Um, we can link each piece together. But that's where we also come into a really interesting part. Is um, remember, it's a physical product. So you, okay, sure, you want to move the yarn around. Yep, you got the needles. It'll do that. How far can you move them before the yarn breaks? Because remember, this is still a physical thing there. So if you do start doing things like that, what's going to happen? Well, that's that. Um, that is again what they said for their um, uh, transfer algorithm. Let's see if I can find the. They probably won't. Um, yeah, because we're not going to go over the thing here. Um, I guess we'll kind of, as I try to screen share a little bit of this again, my apologies, it's a little bit of a weird uh, thing in Bobber. Um, just flick back over to it. And so, and so here's the thing they do here. So basically each loop in that kind of thing, you have to kind of move around on those two beds without any of those links breaking. How far can you go without those links breaking? Well, that's what they kind of have on there is they figured out the way to actually calculate based on your current slice, the current thing and ever, um, how far can that kind of stuff go? And so that's like the real secret sauce um, in the paper. Um, let me switch back to, there we go. Um, that goes back into what they call their um, transfer planning algorithm as we kind of go through there. And also do note, another thing I did kind of find out when we we're going over this is that this is not transfer learning, which is apparently some kind of machine learning algorithm. I'm sure there's probably uh, things uh, coming, coming back and going through with this. Um, probably what they're actually doing is this is a transfer planning algorithm, which is hard to Google for. It's probably something more like a penalty method. So basically their algorithm is described, but they have a penalty factor that goes into each calculation when they're moving around um, the needles and everything like that. So um, uh, let's see, what was it? Yeah, it is basically a huge amount of actual dynamic programming, which is one of my weaknesses on that. So if you do know more about it, feel, please feel free to speak up. But that basically is what they're doing to it, is that they're uh, basically trying uh, to make sure you basically have to keep the needles moving. They're not going to crash into each other. You have to keep the yarn going so it's not going to break and basically move all that stuff around. And so that algorithm, as they said, is what they came up with to actually make sure all that works and is correct. And as they said, they proved that it is complete, which means you're not going to run in any unknown situations. However, I think they said it, they, the, it is not proved that it is optimal for time. So it's the usual, you can't always guarantee it will finish in time, but that I don't think is as much a problem with this kind of work um, as it would be in other kind of things. It isn't like a, there's some hard real time constraints here, but it isn't exactly like you have like um, aircraft or automobiles where you really have to have a thing stop in time. And again, if I'm kind of babbling here, yeah, please go on. I think Trev mentions it's something like O N cubed time, which isn't, yeah, which makes sense. So it's not horrible. Well, it's quote, not horrible compared to doing everything, but it's still not great. But again, there's only kind of so much you can kind of do with this, so. Um, what else are we talking? I know I'm going to try not to go super fast on here because there's a bunch of more things. Um, 
Oh yes, the collapse expands. So you saw when the the two beds um, going back and forth, and you, there's nothing to really see there because I might use my hands. So you saw the two beds actually kind of going back and forth and whatever like that. They actually have what they call the collapse expand part, where they're actually showing. You know, you can also break it down in terms of that kind of thing, where you're trying not to break the yarn when you kind of move around there. I think what do they say in the whole? Yes, and they're doing. Yeah, the algorithm says um, they'll shift it by an offset if it decreases the penalty function while not moving any stitches outside the free needle range. So a lot of it's the whole kind of th keeping track of where all these kinds of things are. You have the needles moving the hooks around. You have the yarn going there. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. I'm actually amazed they got the algorithm down to like only that few like half a page there basically. So. And so basically, and all this is worked out ahead of time. It isn't like they're doing this on the fly as you're going through the machine or whatever. Basically, you have all these things mapped out through the algorithm. So at the end of it, all you get out are the actual machine instructions to the machines themselves. And yeah, the final transfer planning is uh, assigns roll values to every stitch and this kind of uh, iteratively makes a greedy choice about it. And again, I'm a little bit bad on that. Actually, yeah, let's just jump over to the... Uh, paper itself just for where is it oh there we go and here we go so yes here's the actual paper as we've all read and that kind of thing so yes here's the transfer plan kind of up here where they talk about their moving kind of stuff so they basically break it down in each one of these little operations kind of here and you can see they've actually weighted each of these links too here which i suspect how they're doing the whole uh, penalty function as you can kind of see hopefully you can kind of see my pointer doing there, but they have each one of these. So basically they have to make sure each one of these doesn't get too high when they move them around. And the, so you have to take into account that the beds are moving, the yarn stretching, the needles are moving around. So all this has to get kind of done back into that. And again, for a lot of modern compiler techniques, this isn't bad considering we have things like Spark or uh, MIPS where you're kind of shoveling things around with register files and that kind of thing. So in terms of compiling, this is actually not too bad of a problem. So anyway. Um, but from going on with that, um, as you can see here, they got basically the simple, yeah, basically the transfer planning outer loop you know, basically goes like this, you know, that assign the role. And then of course, while well, a penalty is greater than zero, you know, keep doing all this kind of stuff, collapse, expand, collapse, expand. And if, you know, uh, check the penalty, move it into there and then uh, categorize. No, that's not categorized. I'm sorry. As I said, <laughs> dynamic programming is definitely one of my weaker spots. They didn't do a whole lot of that. And so there's a lot of this that is from control theory and whatever is actually really fascinating. Um, it's not quite the same as like an actual movement applying algorithm like for a robot, but it does seem really similar. Uh, concatenate, thank you, yes. That's right, yes. Yeah. So it is the Unix cat, not the actual the catalog. And oof. Anyway, so yeah. Um, Anyway, so yes, all this has kind of come down to saying like, all right, so now we can basically take this whole kind of thing, translate this patterns, translate it in rows, feed it in here, have a whole thing mapped out. So we know that all these machine instructions we generate are not going to break the machine and can actually complete in time. But they actually keep, they haven't shown us like actually how does that work? Like there's no language, like how do you describe this stuff? You know, in terms of, you know, they didn't, I'm not sure if they use stitching or the maps or things like that. But what they did do is, let's see if I can, oops. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, well, as we flick the sharing screen, and so here we have, as you kind of saw, we talked about earlier, it'll we'll probably talk about, it. I gotta, uh, let's see, can I actually, oh, here we go. Um, you can kind of see this is their actual GUI for actually uh, manipulating. So this is actually the pattern right here, what they're doing. And you can actually see they've got, um, having done 3D uh, modeling, you can kind of see they've got constraints here. It's hard to see where their pointer is going, but they're actually moving these handles around to actually stretch out the primitives and kind of feed around. So each one of these things is like a little primitive. Um, I believe some of these will make a tube, whatever. It's kind of hard here because they kind of gloss over this and just say, oh yeah, we just worked up a GUI and kind of show some kind of stuff here, but they don't actually talk a lot about the GUI, which they could be doing a lot of stuff in the back here. It's kind of one of those, you know, the papers mostly show off the algorithm, the ideas behind it, not the actual tooling around it, which which has some ramifications we'll actually get to in a little bit as well. So anyway, oh, I see. So they've got the, yeah, right. So they're doing like the um, the X axis or Cartesian is needles and that's time. So of course, as, it, as you kind of run up the chart there, it's kind of doing all those stitching and then doing that. So if we know that, yeah, since we have that in mind, you can kind of see where it's going to kind of go up there, oh, spread out that, 
you know, the needles all collapse back in here, stitch out that, and then continue stitching like that. So, um, and again, apologies to the actual professional knitters if you're watching this later on. Um, anyway, but yeah, there's some neat GUI action in here. They're doing some kind of interesting uh, constraint things here. It'd be really nice to see the source code for this or whatever. Unfortunately, that is not covered. Disney, um, parts of Disney, the parts of Disney that are best with source code are usually Pixar or the other graphics uh, team, since they're actually really good about uh, producing repos and things. This, on the other hand, is mostly just, hey, you know, check us out. Here's the paper idea. Um, but that's about it. So anyway, as you can see here, they've, they they kind of show like kind of, uh, yeah, so you can see they have some automated, they can actually figure out like, oh, yeah, we have to connect it if we're going to do these two things. So we're going to kind of go through there. So and that there, I believe, is for one of the hand wars or one of the, no, one of the things. So yeah, you'll kind of see as it goes up through here, does these kind of things. I have no idea what all their symbology means um, for some of this, but it certainly looks really cool. And I'm sure they know what it means. Oh, yes. And you can see that's that shows how they actually specialize out all the rows, um, pull it out, and bam, into like the whole little actual little sheets you can kind of feed into there. And that they also don't mention the paper looks to be kind of how they're doing uh, some of their internal language kind of stuff there too. They just mentioned we're translating the operations, so I believe that's yeah. Knit. So basically, that's kind of a whole yeah assembly language ops right there. Like knit takes y1 and f5 as the arguments. Um, someone just posted a thing in there. Um, no, oh, sorry, I was doing a whole like. Anyway, um, back to it. So, um, yeah, transfer as you do the operations, kind of things like that. So, uh, and anyway, so yes, all well, all well and good. So yes, we have the paper. We've done these things. Um, it's super cool. So yes, they basically done that. They proved out, as we said, uh, the algorithm itself is complete and whatever. Um, they mentioned in the paper here. Um, they're using the 15 gauge V bed knitting machine with 15 needles per inch and 91 centimeter. There's this goes into actual gauge warp and weft of the yarn, and yes, different yarn, different yarns uh, have different characteristics, which you have to be careful of. And the needles gauge apparent will sh can determine how much how thick the yarn you can pull through, but also how thin you can get because a thicker a thicker gauge is better at pulling the heavier yarn, but not so good for smaller ones. Or it might be re been reversed. All I know is that. The exact same techniques also work in machining. So, in fact, if you have if you have a French press, that little mesh strainer in the bottom there was probably machine knitted by an actual machine designed to weave with wire and not a yarn. Yes, it is amazing. And I've actually there's a there's a neat comment on a, on lobsters. We actually a second accommodative claiming some engineer he knew des, uh, just for grins wove like a half oh something like you know small kind of things of wire there and like a whole kind of jack and ended up being like you know fairly. You could basically throw rocks in and have it bounce off. So yes, you can, as long as your needles are strong enough and the gauge is taken into account, you can knit a whole lot of things. Anything that turns into any one-dimensional lines can go into a two-dimensional structure, which they also kind of point on the paper here too. I mean, no, they don't. Sorry, that's the Wikipedia stuff points that out. You're basically taking a 1D strain, a 1D line turning into a 2D object. <sighs> Yes, math, geometry, it's really fun. This is, again, why I really like this paper, kind of flicking over it and even looking into it. There's like a whole lot of, you know, we can just say, well, we've got a compiler to knit things. It's like, well, what? that involves like so much into there. You've got the whole, you can, your knitting itself takes 1D things, turns them into 2D stuff. And they, they said we can also then do the linking and we can then generate the instructions to kind of uh, run all this kind of stuff. They're, they're basically flexing with the transfer planning stuff, but the, the whole idea of just even breaking down stuff in instructions or whatever is a fairly uh, kind of neat thing. And um, we'll actually get to, let's see, I'm trying to see what else we are in the paper. We've been kind of going, I've been kind of skipping around a little bit because again, um, some parts are more meant for discussion. Part of the other things I got too, uh, also a little bit into, was also the mechanics behind it, having done, um, it's always one of those whole, okay, this is kind of cool, but how can I actually do this at home kind of questions. It's like, well, how do I? And I, that kind of led me down a rabbit hole for a while, which took up more time than the actual reading the paper of actually figuring out like how and what and why. And it's like, there's a lot of things in here, which is kind of what the rest of these slides kind of cover a bit. Um, as we jump back to, oh, I know. And let's see, where are we going? Colors machine. There we go. Anyway, now we're back to the uh, thingy here. Oh, yes. Trev mentioned um, open knit in the instructions there. And we'll 
kind of covered that. One of the other is there's a lot of, um, I guess we're kind of coming to that. Oh, yeah, video highlights. We've kind of gone over a bit of that. Anyway, okay, yeah. So I guess we are kind of out of the whole part of the talk. So the paper, as usual, kind of glosses over some of the really practical bits in there where they just say, well, we have a general industrial thing. You know, it'll work on all, mach on all knitting machines. Like, well, there's a thing here because I've said knitting machines have been around for a while. And there's plenty of ways to knit whatever. But how complicated are these machines? Um, to do it and how can you actually do it at home? Well, the open knit, for example, is a neat little thing you can build out of parts in an Arduino. A lot of them are basically Arduino shields. The problem is that they don't have any kind of real actual instructions as far as I can tell. They basically just have some Arduino functions for doing simple G codes kind of so like, you know, lift the tool or lift the yarn thing. There's no actual instructions that look anything similar to what we just talked about. So there are even other kind of things like the open kinetic or Synetic, I'll put the link in the notes, which is like a tubular knitting machine, which the, although those exist, we talk here about flatbed machines, which look exactly like an old dot matrix printer, but there are also tubular knitting machines, which are more specialized for socks and things, but they both can work in the same kind of idea. But again, is there a common machine language or kind of instructions with them, with, especially with the open source stuff? It turns out there really isn't. So, um, so yeah, so part of this was looking up was also, oh, is there cheap ways to do it? And it says like, it basically comes down to brother. And yes, this is the printer manufacturer machines from the 1980s. That is going to be your cheapest way you can kind of do this stuff at home, basically, is to find, um, um, if you find, as I flick through all my things here. Oh, yes, this is, um, let's see, there's my, oh, no, it's kind of vanished there. Um, this is actually, I think the link is in here. This is from a neat, um, uh, did we go over? Oh, here it is. Knittable seashells. This, ironically enough, is from a Papers We Love conference in 2016 or no, 2017 that I attended and actually got to show who is here in Seattle, by the way. She actually knits uh, scarves that have actual seashell uh, pebbles and things on there. And towards the end of it, she actually did talk about um, how she got started doing it. She was more interested in the algorithms of doing the seashells. How does the thing work? It turns out she basically, yeah, bought like a, a Brother KH 930 machine from 1981, which there are videos of online. And the, she reckons a KH 910 and an Arduino shield from Evil Mad Scientist. But basically, this is going to cost you about several hundred dollars. One, you're going to have to find an old Brother machine. They're still out there. But again, you got to find them. They're about the size of oh, a radiator at desk, I think. They're, there's also good videos online showing people using them. They basically, it looks like a giant, Imagine a synthesizer keyboard, except with an actual loom in the front there. You feed in you feed in instructions to the thing. You basically just keep swiping the loom back and forth, kind of like you're the actual manual operation on a, on a dot matrix printer. Really neat kind of videos you can do it. So that's the cheapest way you can do it. Or you can try building one of your own, which, again, is totally done standard. Let's get into the elephants in the room, um, the big players, which is the other thing I discovered reading up on this kind of stuff. Shima Seiki. Um, who I believe were originally Japanese. They might be Southeast Asian now. I'm not sure. They're big enough. And Stahl, who are German, very German. That's it. Literally. Those two companies own about 90% of the flatbed market, as she said. Um, this was in 2017, as she talked about it. She bought a used Stahl CMS 530HP 7.2 gauge machine. That was about 3,000 pounds. It was used from 2009, so that's already about you know almost 10 years old at that point. She had to raise a Kickstarter for it. It was not cheap, apparently. I'm willing to bet it was still in the, even used. It was still in like the five figures at the very minimum. Um, and she had to spend two months in Germany training on it. In German, by the way, since apparently the English class was full. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to say here is that you know the actual when they talk about Shimaseki machines, X beds, and these things, all these things are not cheap, and they are very big, expensive machines. Hence, the whole trying to make sure you're not going to break the machine when you're feeding these kinds of things through it. Um, so a lot of these, when they keep just kind of throwing off references, when they say, "Oh yeah, we couldn't afford an X bed," like, well, no kidding. Like, I don't even want to imagine how much Disney, having worked for them, is probably not going to drop any money just to get an X bed machine for you to play with. It's going to be whatever some of the costume designers have kind of laying around the room. So the point is, again, I was all these kinds of things uh, and whatever. Oh, have we hit the end? Oh, dear. Uh, so that's like I said, I ran a little bit out of time with some of the slides. We can look at a few videos if you want. Um, oh, that's right. So we'll come back to. Right. Yes, that's where I remember. Um, also some missing notes. Um, I think the other point that I'm going here, too, is that. Um, 
it costs, it's kind of like chip fabbing. You'll see some of that with Shenzhen, like Buddy Huang has some really excellent videos, but basically these are kind of like buying industrial machines, kind of like you're setting up your own lab and fab. And again, they're not cheap. They'll do these things. But one of the things too, is that it said, again, the paper it was in 2016 or something like that. They mentioned they had the Shimaseki V machines. They also mentioned, ah, that's right, specializing in, oh, translating to the, uh, oh, where is it? Translating to ah, Shimaseki's, um, uh, both of theirs, like a knit paint and Sintrol for the machine languages for Shinseki and, and Stahl. Those apparently don't exist anymore, or if they do, they're not letting you see them. I actually tried pretty hard to actually figure out if you could do these things, the knit paints or whatever, and no. It, you only All I could find is like literally just antivirus things about dot, .dat files from that. So there is really no way to kind of even see how this kind of would work at this point. So I think the thing we're going through here, oh, did someone find it? I would love to see it if you can, but it's... I, uh, I, I attended a, uh, a strange loop presentation on, on knit paint. Oh. Uh, like a few years, it was, I don't know, it must have been five years ago now. But yeah, it, it was, it was the, the, the Strange Loop talk was all about how knit paint is, is a really weird thing. It's a, it's a graphical programming language, sort of like, um, the, there's a couple of aesthetic programming languages that are, that use, gra like the graphics are the programming language. And so it was basically like different colors. Uh, and shapes meant different things, and that's how you programmed it uh, mm -hmm. through uh, all through graphics. Uh, there, there was no that was the compiled language, right? So. And I'm pretty sure that's what the instructions they're talking about when they kind of can specialize to that. I think is yeah. I'm willing to bet that's kind of how it works. There's I could easily jump into sharing a bunch of things. It's kind of hard because I was trying to see if I could pull out pieces, and it's hard. Shimaseki again, like these, a lot of these companies are big enough. They're industrious. Like if you're calling them, you already want one of their things. You know, they're not going to. You can't. They're not really interested in talking to randos who just want to learn about things on there. So all their videos they have will occasionally show some of their stuff, but it's really hard to actually even kind of pull out what that kind of stuff looks like. I tried like scrubbing through a whole bunch of their videos to actually see if we can see some of this stuff. And no, I'd have to actually try to jump into these things and find them. So yeah, I know you can find the YouTube links and please absolutely do. It's yeah. If you look for just Shimaseki, the knitting or the knitting machine stuff, you'll find zillions and zillions of videos and things. There's actually, if you even go further down there, you'll actually have, there's a lot more uh, software for actually dealing with some of this stuff for, Oh, as we're trying to wrap this back up into at least, uh, you know the paper kind of thing uh, the interesting thing i found was that as the end of their at the end of the paper they talk about a lot of things they were planning on doing which they may or may not have done was the whole uh, knit fabrication yeah texturing and kind of uh, knit assembly language one of the things interesting is that they mentioned knit paint and kind of the whole okay good yes yeah, so there's a video there one of the things that's fascinating is that when i was searching for this kind of stuff um, they mentioned yeah since this paper is from then has been cited in a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, the Wikipedia entry on knitting machine, if you look at it, they literally just ripped the assembly language part of this paper out, just stuffed it in there and just cut and pasted it there and just said, Oh, that's how all knitting machines work, which isn't far off, but it's still kind of one of those. That's um, but with the point of here is what I'm trying to say though, is that yes, these are big companies. They've been doing this for probably at least decades. Um, they're not going to be slacking around just kind of, uh, resting their laurels. What I'm trying to say right now is if you actually search for Shimaseki um, whole garment as one word, you will actually get a whole even kind of machine specializing, machines and actual uh, CAD design thing that will actually let you print out whole garments just like this paper. So I have, a, I have a distinct suspicion that a lot of this knit paint things have been quietly going away, that they're trying to push, that they've been basically ramping up. They took a lot of these lessons. There's some other really interesting papers on knitting and languages out there. I'm suspecting they took that to heart and are quietly doing their own products and projects on them that again, you're not gonna see from off the street. You know, If anyone can find these things, I would love to see some of these things. But, so that is kind of the whole thing there um, with the paper and with that. So basically, yeah, here's the four, here's the major operations for an abstract knitting machine. Here's an algorithm, here's a compiler algorithm uh, based on penalty method that can actually specialize and translate this stuff. And here's also, here's our, 
you know, simple GUI tool for doing all this kind of thing. So this paper, this one idea, it's like a whole, could we do a better way than just like programming tool heads manually? Yes, we can. It involves all these kinds of fascinating kinds of parts of the paper that they all kind of tie in together and just kind of, yeah, oh, and by the way, there's this thing and that this thing. I'm like, what, what? You just kind of, as you're reading through the thing, obviously there's this, the coolness of the algorithm, but it was the whole, just other kinds of things out there that were kind of really appealing to me. And that's kind of why I really like this paper. It's just the whole things there. There's lots of cool specializations and it is something that Disney likes to say. We like, we, you know, this could be interesting for kind of future use. Sure. Let's find us a bunch of guys to work on this for a bit. I will also note that I think stall, I know one of them, if it's Shimaseki or stall now actually has a partnership with Drexel university as well. So I suspect they're also doing training. I suspect, in the heart of it because remember when i uh, when i said it used to be a lot of places would just you would knit automate you would have the machine knit the tube or the sheet then you would have some people just hire it together or hire some people to then just knit together and people are cheap that way and that's really hard for a machine to do i suspect that this kind of went in overdrive when the pandemic hit because now all of a sudden well, those kind of people got to be working in a small room that's probably unventilated and all their stuff kind of stuff so i suspect there's been a lot more drive into the fully automated knitting and so there's been a whole lot of this pressure there. I know there are some, also some really neat videos talking about, you know, not just fashion designers, but people that specialize in this, um, raving over certain kinds of uh, fashion software. It turns out with the CG industry, we're going a, fit, a bit far afield from the paper at this point. It turns out there's cloth simulations and lots of really good ones. It turns out people have already thought about taking those and using them to actually work with clothes. Because one of the other problems you have to remember is it's a physical product. What's it going to look like on a human body when it comes out? You can obviously just kind of spit things into there and you can sketch it, which is the usual designer tool. But there's now tools you can get out there that will actually, you can design it in the 3D, have it drape over a person to actually see how it fits for underwear or for tight fit stuff that's apparently really useful. Uh, again, most of the stuff will not be cheap. There's some kind of entry level stuff. Some stuff will do like full on, we will simulate it and also buy your yarn and do the whole kinds of things for it. So, but yes, yeah, so there's a whole lot of interesting kind of, the things that this paper kind of scratched the surface and said for automated garment knitting and all these things, there's a lot more under the surface. that's kind of hard as someone who's primarily CS to kind of discover with this. So it's really kind of fascinating just to see all this kind of thing and have this all kind of wrapped up into one, you know, it's not even like what, 10 pages of paper basically covers the whole thing and it involves a whole lot of ideas. So yeah, as I said, it's a bit shorter since I covered the history and some of the background of it, but yes, that's pretty much why I love this paper. So that's pretty much the end of my formal talk on the paper. So, and at this point, please uh, tell me what do what do you ever what does everyone think about this then? Matt, I think it's rad. Uh, it's super cool. Uh, Max, your headphones up. I wish I understood anything about knitting. <laughs> that was it. I I knew a little bit of some of the stuff, the knitting and purling. Um, like I said, there's actually some cosplayers I know. In fact, I'll probably have to talk to her. I should have talked to her uh, last week or the week before, who actually works in aerospace and probably actually does know a lot more about uh, knitting machines. But yeah, there's a lot. Maybe, yeah, it, maybe not industrial knitting machines. Those are it's a little specialized. It's a little specialized, but again, the basic techniques I said are the similar kind of thing. You're ba it's the same kind of idea. They just have a whole, like the knitting deal. You know, a human knitter can have like what, like two, maybe three needles going. There's other specialized tools. You know, you can, now you can have like at least 15 to 20 to 30 kind of things going at once. So it's a similar idea, just kind of scale. It's the same technique, just scaled up to like a, you know, giant thing. You know, it's the same with the dot matrix. Four, but she's kind of a big deal. Who? My mother-in-law. I did not even know that. So she's a, she's a boss, you know. <laughs> so, so yes. Yeah. The other thing too is yeah, if people want to talk about it, my problem is I said the dynamic for the dynamic programming, the algorithm I kind of understand, and I had to search a bit on that, but that's kind of like the weakest part. It's like I, it's like I, okay, I can see the algorithm itself, and I assume it works, but dynamic programming, as I is one of my weaknesses. So it was kind of hard for me to little understand that part of the paper a little bit. I do like they proved it was complete, if not necessarily time optimal. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, uh, I, I put a link to the strange Loop 2016 paper that, uh, that the, uh, Alba, um, uh, did, and she's one of the authors of this paper and the, and her, the, her talk is on this paper. Uh, so if you, if anyone wants to dive deeper into this, like she has a, uh, an hour long talk just about this entire paper, uh, from trains. It was really good. Um, she came back in 2018 and did a talk on, on weaving, uh, uh on, 
a weeping compiler that, that she created is like totally different but like she's she's like totally geeks out on stuff it's rad yeah when i mentioned yeah since weaving it weaving and knitting are not quite because the weaving is the whole you have the giant loom and the shuttle ring back and forth and that if i would, had more time or would want to get more into that we could have gone over the whole you know how that basically inspired module modern digital computers by having the whole jackward cards and that techniques so we could even had an actual real occasion to actually cover the luddites themselves Oh yeah, the, I mean, the actual luddite. The actual luddite, not the actual yeah. term. So yeah, it's there's like I said, there's a lot of really. I was like, that was kind of the way it was slowing me down for some preparing. It was like the whole like there's a lot of really things you could be talking about just to kind of set the stage for, especially to a primarily CS audience. So yeah, great man, that was awesome. So anyway, and yes, please from the crowd for anyone if you got questions in chat, want to talk up. Yes, you can talk. Please come up and talk, and do whatever. So. Um. Trying to think what else I was finding there. Yes, I remember you. You and I. I'm pretty sure I was there with you. We went to see the knitting seashells thing, which was impressive. Oh yeah, at uh, I, I I think that was a papers you love con. It was that internal one at Strange Loop, I believe. I, yeah, it was like they did. Yeah, like is is a PLW conf. Uh, we there there was a and and later on we got and uh, heard her speak at papers you love Seattle because she was a. Uh, uh, I think we got her to speak papers of Seattle because she she's local to Seattle. She's local to right. She has a company uh, here like Knit Yak, I think. Yeah, I saw her at a Maker Fair um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, still, still making uh, still models, knitting, still sort of randomly generated uh, uh, arts. Yeah, see so if we can actually find the. Yeah. yeah, I wonder where. I wonder if she's still doing it. Yeah, well, she's still doing it here. She's see her her shop's page is busted. I tried looking that up too. Oh. Apparently, her her shop page is busted right now. But yeah, I was actually kind of looking up some of the other things. I actually, see. Uh, she 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 had she she ran out industrial space down in uh, um, uh, Georgetown, right? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Let's see if I can actually. Oh, here we go. Uh, actually, is this guy doing there? We go. Hopefully, you're seeing the same thing. All right, there you go. That's like a, a slide from the video, but yes, that's kind of that patterns we're talking about right here. So basically, kind of like a, you find a shells. Oh, share oh, is it not sharing? Uh, there we go. Is it now it's just sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it, yeah, and Jitsi's a bit weird. Anyway, but these are like you might find shells at the beach then. She actually algorithmic she was really interested in this it turns out there's actually like kind of and what camera for was finding automata but like the ways to actually generate this kind of stuff which is what she was interested in and then the whole doing the doing the uh, knitting of them automatically kind of came out from that which is again where she started with the brother machine and then worked up to the thing in fact i think i might just push up the youtube to see if i can the youtubes and since we're just doing the recording of recording where's the okay Oh yeah, you're probably seeing my screen when I'm doing this, but uh... oh come on, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I can find it. Uh, sweep through. Oh yeah, lots of really fun. I think I don't know if she's actually got. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Yeah, she talks a bit about this. It turns out the old machines, like these brother ones, were also programmed literally by bitmaps. So it's actually actual pixels, which also apparently shows up in the actual knitting literature. They're even called pixels in the literature as well for some of this stuff. But basically, you actually program the old machines. You literally have a bitmap you program into it that actually controls each needle to kind of go up and down. Hence the need for the Arduino shields, because as she says, either is expecting like an old floppy disk drive from the 80s, or you key in the pattern by hand, kind of like manually programming a drum machine, which no. So the Arduino shield is basically hacking the way of just pushing all the buttons super rapidly to, to load up the machine's memory with all this kind of stuff. And I wish, let's see. Yeah, I, I put in a link in the in the chat to- Okay. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually seeing- All, I can all find. yarns are beautiful. That's the name yes, that was the Matt Evil Mad Scientist link, and that's basically just the shield kit itself, just to do it. You still have to find the machine yourself. They're not going to yeah, find it for you. Yeah, you got to buy one of the machines, but like once you get it, you can buy this uh, uh, ABAY or uh, AY yeah. 
shield and poof, there you go, your officer bases. Yeah, see if I can find it. I know there's a nice video which shows one of these things um, in action, or at least hacking the... Yeah, whoever can find it. But yeah, it was kind of the whole, I hadn't realized, you basically just kind of sweep the thing across there, and it basically just sounds like you're an old dot matrix printer, but you're the actual one moving the print head instead of the machine, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's see, I'm trying to think. Oh, so. Oh yeah, I can do up. Um... What got you into this? Mostly, um, it, when I was working for Disney, it was actually fun just to, once I found out Disney Research as a site existed, it was just kind of fun just to kind of pop up and browse through all the things in there, you know, and mm -hmm. I was like one of those, like, wait, a 3D compiler for what now? And I actually remember reading that a while ago and just thinking like, this is actually kind of cool. I don't, again, at the time I was like, I don't understand a whole lot of this, but this is actually kind of neat. Like, why isn't, why isn't everything doing it now? Why isn't everything, why isn't all fashion automated kind of thing, deal, so. Because yeah, it yeah, turns it, out knitting is a specialized. No, no. It turns out the machine. The, it turns out because that to do the machines that do it is extremely expensive. And again, if it was, I suspect if it hadn't been for the pandemic, there wouldn't have been a push for it. I'm actually let's see. I'll share my screen again. This is what I found that looks extremely I mean, I suspicious. Found, huh? I found an article from 2019 before the pandemic, where Shin Sekai is talking about how they are. Um, they're. Uh, it's from July 4th, 2019. Mm -hmm. And Shin Sekai, uh, Shima Sekai is talking about how their knitting technology can revolutionize space outside of just fashion, like mm -hmm. clothes, because you can use it for clothes, but like not just for wearing anymore. Huh. The thing they meant, one of the things they mentioned is, um, one of the things they mentioned is it's like a giant article going through how cool Shima Sekai's new machine at new machines are. That's a lot of their articles unfortunately. It's that whole knitting industry. Yeah. yeah. Um uh, and no, but they they talk about how they're trying to like for wearables, like what if you could have your wearable computer and your nice little Shin Sekai knit thing. Right? I mean, that's kind of cool. Or casual luxury sh casual and luxury shoes. Here's the um, whole garment thing in the in the chat there. A lot of that I also suspect too, they're talking about how you can do one-offs and things and also let's you make more things. I think the other thing too is they're also taking, like a lot of the fashion industry gets a lot of hit on for uh, environmental reasons. Like with Uniqlo and whatever, you know, with such cheap clothes, the problem is, uh, especially a lot of businesses for hygiene, whatever, oh, we couldn't sell this or oh, someone tried it on, we can't sell it. So a lot of apparent stuff apparently gets dumped a lot of times. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of no. There's a lot of thing. I knew that for quite a while ago. That's yeah. There's a lot of the whole. And again, it's the whole like retail merchandise. Like, well, we someone wore it. We can't sell anymore. Get rid of it. And where's it go? Landfill. And the problem is that also doesn't get talked to like yarns and things are extremely water expensive. It's the cotton cut, growing the cotton or all the plants, oh, yeah. Yeah. weaving them together and dyeing them. That's a very water expensive. So they actually point out like a lot of throwaway garments are a lot. A lot of water went into making those things. So I suspect. Shimaseki is actually going for the whole like now you can do one offs or do more easier fit kind of things and they're, that's what they're trying to hype for for that. And you so can, and you can it's like made on demand but cheaply because it's mm -hmm. just a computer. As long yeah. as you can, as long as you can pitch up the unfront, upfront cost, there's no waste. Exactly, and they, and again, their their market is basically the smaller uh, places like you know actual garment industry places, not just like the one person designing their thing, but like an actual you know clothing house or kind of you know a lot of There's... the emails a lot of the youtube videos i saw were from like uh act none of the videos i saw were from like Amer like english-speaking nations no nope. on youtube it was like nope. one was uh from something called like uh like arabic something mm -hmm. uh arabic nation or like iran something i think one was in bangladesh like bangladeshi mm -hmm. oh. it's a whole thing is it's basically the whole um yeah, like how much is it, it the machine cost versus we have to hire all these people to do it was the kind of the trick there. And like I said, even yeah, but yeah, even before the pandemic, there would be the whole like how many people you have to hire to knit together these kinds of things. Other thing too is I as I gathered is that just printing out the things the old way is also a lot of waste because you have to snip off the yarns and that. So apparently there's a lot of waste that will actually happen just from making one segment. 
um, so apparently this supposedly will also reduce that kind of bit there too. Again, that's I believe that. Yeah, so. I, I've, watched, I've watched enough how it's made to realize like how much waste occurs in in all this stuff. It's it's. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this paper cited in a bunch of other places as well. So I suspect, like I said, this was kind of like a foundation thing. But some of the other, you know, some of their CAD software stuff, some other places will talk about this thing. But I've seen it mentioned. I think this actually, it might, I think it was actually submitted to the ACM. If not, it might have been submitted to even the graphics part of the ACM. Oh, yeah, it was submitted to SIGGRAPH. So, yeah, so they, right. considered it, they considered it almost like a graphics paper, basically. When, it makes sense. Th there's... Um... Does Disney do any sort of knitting stuff themselves? Oh yes. Yeah. They won't necessarily do it. They're not like. I mean, you like you make a whole bunch of merch, right? You do, but I'm going to bet a lot of it. You know, the super cheap stuff will get usually made in factories. But I suspect what this stuff comes out for is like the Imagineers or for also stuff in the uh, parks. I suspect. Of yeah. A lot easier to run off stuff, especially if you have to do kind of weird or whatever stuff like this. Which is why I'm, which is why I'm willing to bet they had a machine lying around they could use. It was basically. You know, at some point you can just buy the machine because again, it, and speaking for people there, the parks and uh, the Imagineers are kind of like the research department of uh, Disney for parks specialized in other practical effects. So, and if and I've been having worked there briefly and actually been to some of the Imagineers labs, 